Well, good morning, everyone. I'm sure you can feel the excitement in the air. We are on the cusp of a big week at Christ Church at Grove Farm. I'm really excited about Vacation Bible School and all that's going to be a part of it. Listen, if you have contributed in some way so far, whether by buying supplies or if, if you have signed up to volunteer, you registered kids, thank you for doing that. I want to call everyone to be praying this week. I mean, this is a gospel week, and we're going to do our best to love the kids, to to give them um, a fun experience, of course, safe experience. Ultimately, our hope is this, is that, that there would be a great harvest this week. That not only would seeds be planted, but that there would be expression of faith, commitment to Christ. That's a real commitment. And so we, we pray that um, God will move in that way. And I'm calling on you to pray in that way. Join in together. It's a huge week. Think about it. We've got, we've got volunteers of all ages serving. I love it. We'll have a lot of teenagers running around here serving, having a great time with that. And then we'll have adults all the way up to our oldest members serving together. That's a beautiful thing. And then, of course, with the kids here, it is a great, great time. And we go all in for it. And, and that includes you. So be praying for Vacation Bible School, please. Let's pray now. Lord, we, we do uh, stand with anticipation this morning. Anticipation of your goodness. Anticipation of the gospel of a harvest, Lord. And we're excited to see everyone being, being made fully mature in Christ, presented fully mature in Christ, even beginning with Vacation Bible School, that our kids would begin that journey towards maturity in Christ, life in Jesus this weekend. We're looking forward to, Lord, the opportunities we pray for, yes, fun and safety and all the things that come along with it in order. But we also, Lord, pray for a great harvest through the gospel of Jesus Christ. Work in hearts, Lord. Use us. Lord, this morning we come with anticipation to your word. Speak to us. We're listening. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, a heart to believe. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read to you from Acts 27. That's where we are. We're in the final two weeks of our series in Acts, which is stretched for now a year and a half. We are in Acts 27 today. And let's begin by reading the first two verses of Acts 27. It goes like this. When it was decided that we would sail for Italy, Paul and the others prisoners were handed over to a centurion named Julius who belonged to the Imperial Regiment. We boarded a ship, and then along the way it says here that they put out to sea. So let's, let's contextualize all this. In my Bible, the, the title of this section is Paul Sails for Rome. Now, this was something that came with much anticipation. Paul, if you remember last week when we were in Acts 26, Paul had appealed to Caesar. He was a prisoner, and he appealed his case to Caesar, and so going to Rome was something that he had on his mind. In fact, Paul had been longing to go to Rome for a long time. Think about this. If you go, you can connect things in the Bible. It's amazing. I was thinking about this this week. If you go to Romans 1.11, there Paul writes... I long to come and see you. And he wrote that while he was in Corinth. And when was he in Corinth? Acts 18. This is all connected. In fact, in Acts 23, verse 11, the Lord tells Paul that he is called to go to Rome to testify. And so this is something that Paul has been looking, waiting for the opportunity for a long time. And so, they set sail. And the plan was, as you read the scriptures, I'm going to condense some of this because there's a lot of verses here. As you, as you read the text, you see that the plan was for Paul, who is a prisoner, keep in mind. He's on this ship as a prisoner. And the, the plan was that they were going to stop along the way at some ports. And everything was pretty good. In fact, uh, the, the, the centurion who was in charge of this vessel actually was showing Paul favor. They stopped in a place called Sidon, 
And there inside, and he let him free to go visit with his friends. The, the grace of God was upon Paul, even working through the centurion while he was under, under armed guard with, you know, as a prisoner. But, but after that, they got back on the boat, and they experienced some difficulty, but they landed in a place, and I love this. The scripture includes this. I think it's in verse 8 of 27. They, they landed in a place called Fair Havens. Now, isn't that a nice place to be, huh? Fair Havens, where, where it's always 80 degrees. The skies are always blue, and the grass is always green. Fair Havens. Don't you like it when you're in the Fair Havens of life? Well, Paul wasn't in the Fair Havens for very long because they set out from Fair Havens, and almost immediately, the winds changed direction, and all of a sudden, the winds were against them. And they were going into what was a fierce, fierce storm. It's very appropriate that, that Pastor Brad this morning led us in the song, The Lord of Hosts. You're with us, Lord, with us in the battle, with us in the fire, with us in the storm. Because today I want to talk to you about storms. Storms are, are a metaphor. And I think that they can be a helpful metaphor to us as we consider our lives and what's happening. I'll tell you this personally. I don't know how you feel about this. I feel like life is essentially a series of storms. Doesn't it feel that way? I mean, even just think about the weather patterns here lately. This past week, we had a pretty fierce storm. It caused some of us to not have power for a day or two, which is a, a, a modern annoyance that, that we really get put out by. Yeah, storms. And in fact, later today, there may be another storm that comes into town. And this week, I read this morning that the Northeast is going to experience some storms. They're always coming and going. This is the way life is. And, and it doesn't matter whether it's like you lose your job. That's a storm. If you're experiencing marriage strife, that's a storm, big time. Maybe you've been diagnosed with cancer or some kind of illness, major storm. Could be a loved one who has that kind of diagnosis, right? There, there's so many different ways. You might be a student. You might be bombing your classes. Or maybe you bombed this past year. By the way, students, I've been there. I know what that's like. And you're facing the storm that comes along with that. There are a variety of storms. There's a variety of intensity of those storms. And the truth is they come and go. And when Brad says, I want to encourage you if you're in a storm, that we know we're speaking to people who are in storms, or at least you've got one coming up. Paul was facing a storm. And I want to humanize Paul. You know, he, he's certainly a super apostle, right? He's, he's an amazing man of God. We talk about him 2,000 years later, the ways that God used him, his faith, his example, his teachings. Wow, that's a lot. But he was also a human. And I can only imagine that Paul, having been looking forward to going to Rome for such a long time, I can only imagine that he, at least maybe in his heart, if he didn't say it out loud, at least in his heart, he said, why, Lord? What, why is this happening? You've called me to Rome. Why are we experiencing these winds? Why is this storm on the horizon? And I think we're no different, right? Let's humanize our experience. I know you're sitting in pews this morning and we're singing songs to God. What a great thing to do. But the reality is that the human heart says, why, God? Why is this happening in my marriage? I feel called to this job, God. Lord, I feel, I feel called to this community. Why is this happening? That's real. That's real. Well, listen, we're going to be in Acts 27, and we're going to see a great storm here. And here's what I want you to really pay attention to. Pay attention to this. See how Paul and the others, his companions, handle this storm, approach this storm. Because I believe that the lessons that we can learn from Acts 27 are pertinent to our lives and they can help us know how to face any storm. Any storm at all. Let's go there now. So I'm going to show you three things in this passage today. I, we, could show, we could show a lot. I'm going to limit it to three. Defying wisdom. Freaking out. And jumping ship. Let's look at these three things. Let's first look at defying wisdom. Pick back up in the story with me. In Acts 27, let's start in verse 9. Much time had been lost. 
They have now left Fair Havens. Much time had been lost, and sailing had already become dangerous because by now it was after the Day of Atonement. So Paul warned them, Men, I could see that our voyage is going to be disastrous and bring great loss to ship and cargo and to our own lives also. But the centurion, instead of listening to what Paul said, followed the advice of the pilot and of the owner of the ship. Defying wisdom. Okay, so there's a bad decision that's made here. Paul goes to the leadership. Now, he's just a prisoner, but he goes to the leadership. And what does Paul do? He says, hey, listen, right now we're in the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement, by the way, that's Yom Kippur. It's a time of fasting. I think it's a 25-hour fast that the Jews practice, along with some other things. One of the holy days. And it wasn't so much that it was Yom Kippur, but when Yom Kippur falls, it falls in this season between September and November. And during that time, in these days, not much unlike today in the Caribbean, there, there was a tendency for fierce storms to emerge. And so Paul, just in, in very practical wisdom, I think God gave him godly insight. He says, hey, time out, centurion. We probably shouldn't go. It's only going to get worse from here. Let's stay in fair havens. But the centurion, I, I don't know if it was because of just being impatient. I don't know if he's because he was following the majority. You read the story and you see that there was a sense of following the majority. He doesn't listen. Here's what happens. Verse 13. When a gentle south wind began to blow, they saw their opportunity, so they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. So they, they disobeyed the orders. They defied wisdom. And before very long, a wind of hurricane force called the Northeaster swept down from the island. Okay, they're in big, big trouble. A terrible storm emerges. Here's what happens. Again, summarizing some of this. Their boat barely stays together and almost falls apart. Not only that, eventually here, and you'll read this, their cargo. They have to throw their cargo. They have to jettison their supplies and what they have aboard to lighten the load. And not only that, the sky gets so dark, the scriptures say, that they couldn't navigate. They couldn't see the stars. They couldn't see the sun or the moon. It was, the sky was just pitch black, and they're having to navigate at sea in this kind of thing. Now, I want to I point this out. All of this takes place because of the decision made by one person to defy wisdom. One person made a decision, and now everyone. There's, I believe, 260 people above aboard this ship. They're all in this very, very perilous place. And this is the way it is. Storms often come because we disobey God. Make the parallel here. If we're going to carry out the metaphor, we have to see this part too. Because we, de we disobey God, we often experience storms. Now, notice I said often. Okay? Because I want to leave a little space. You may be processing your own life and think, well, what did I do to deserve this? What, what sin is this? Listen, I, I can't answer that. I'm not God. But I will tell you this. Oftentimes, oftentimes, storms come because we disobey. Now, this, this all, to me, as I was preparing this, this all calls to mind an Old Testament connection. I just want to connect this to you briefly. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah and the whale. Okay? Of course, everyone knows that story pretty much. We all are familiar with the idea of a, of a man named Jonah who was swallowed by a well and eventually spit out on the dry land. Now, where it starts is this. God had told Jonah to go to a certain place. Remember the place he was supposed to go? He was supposed to go to Nineveh. But Jonah, what did he do? He disobeyed. The, the scripture says, I believe in Jonah 1.3, I was reading it this week, that he ran away from God. And he hopped on a vessel, a ship. And he got on that ship, and before you knew it, Jonah was also at storm. And it was affecting all the other sailors. This is what happens. You see, we disobey, and we go. And I want to say this, okay? And i got to make this clear. 
the storm in your life very well could be a, a consequence of your disobedience. Not only that, you could be affected by the disobedience of another person. That could be the reason for the storm in your life. This is the way it is. And, and when we go through these kind of experiences, because someone else loves sin more than they love godly wisdom, we, we can end up feeling shipwrecked. Actually shipwrecked. Not just in a storm, but in a place where it feels like life has just crashed. And when that happens, here are the kind of things that I think weigh on our mind. I, I evaluate my own experience in storms. Is there any hope for me in this storm? That's a real thought. And when you're in a storm, you know that, that even the most godly person may ask, is there hope for me in this storm? Is, is there hope for me now that my life is shipwrecked? Listen, I, I do believe this. I do believe this. In the storm, I believe that, that God is seeking to identify our sin in our lives, to show us our sin. I believe that in the storm, God is leading us to repentance, actually. If you're in a storm, the, the right thing to do, almost certainly, is to repent. What God may be trying to bring out of you in the storm is actually a greater dependence on him. That, that could be exactly why this is happening in your life. Okay, so there's a storm. By the way, Paul was shipwrecked three times before this happened. He's on his way to a fourth shipwreck. Is there hope for you? Hmm, let's keep reading. Okay, so let's pick it back up. Verse, uh, let's skip down to verse 18. A little more of this story. So you know they're, in the, they're, they're flying into the storm. They're sailing, rather, into the storm. The scripture says, we took such a violent battering from the storm that the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. On the third day, they threw the ship's tackle overboard with their own hands. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. I want to stop there. We finally gave up hope of being saved. This is the freaking out section, okay? Because this is what we do. When we're in a storm, we abandon all hope. What, what they are doing, this is, this is the effect a storm will have on you when it gets dark. The tendency is to say, I don't think there is any hope. You don't, you don't just question it. You begin to abandon hope. You begin to think you're doomed. You begin to think you'll never get out of it. Several years ago, I saw a movie in the theater with, with Lisa the movie was called The Martian. Maybe you've seen The Martian. This uh, was starring uh, Matt Damon. And in this story, Matt Damon is an astronaut. And he, in this story, is doing a mission on Mars. And uh, during the mission on Mars, he and his team experience a great, great Mars dust storm. You know, that red dust. And in the panic of all this, his team gets onto their vessel and leaves, but he is abandoned. And he's left with little oxygen, little food, little water, not much to survive. He, he gets to a place where he doesn't have much. And, and during this time, he's all alone. That's probably the worst part. With no sense of, of hope of being rescued. And I think that we're prone to feel this way when we are in a storm. When we experience a storm, it's like, it's like we're on Mars, and we're alone, and that there's no hope of being rescued, that we are, here's the word, forsaken, that we're forgotten. This is the tendency that we will face, that we will feel. This is the same thing. Go back to Jonah for a moment. The, the, the crew's response, the Paul's crew on this boat where they're throwing everything overboard and everyone feels like there's no hope, the same thing happens in the story of Jonah. They all freak out. Because Jonah's on this ship, and there's this storm that's raging. We'll talk more about that. They start to throw the cargo overboard in that story. And they freak out. And I think we do the very same thing in our lives. We panic. We throw off everything we know. 
And here's, here's what happens. We question God. And we say, why God? Why is this happening? Let's take a lesson from the life of Paul. I want to point you to Paul because I think, again, there's lessons for us in the storm. Look at verses 21 and 26. Okay, connecting this to the idea of them losing hope, freaking out. Here's what Paul says. After they they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, here this man is a prisoner. He says, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. I love that he put that in their face, right? You should have taken my advice. Then you would have spared yourselves this damage and loss. But now, he says, I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God, of, of, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. And God has graciously, give, graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. Nevertheless, we'll be shipwrecked, he says. But he says, listen, you will be spared. Now, here's what I want you to learn, okay? In the face of, of a storm. I'm putting this into my own heart, by the way. Paul knew a few things. First of all, Paul knew that he was not alone. He knew he was not alone. That the God whom he serves, who called him, that that God very personally was with him even in the storm. And he didn't freak out. Here's what Paul did. Paul waited for God. He waited on the Lord. This is a discipline in the storm that we have to wrap our arms around. And as he waited on the Lord, here's what took place. You heard the scriptures. He was reminded of the promise. Go back to the beginning of the sermon. I told you Paul had been looking forward to going to Rome, remember? That he said, I I long to be with you in Rome. In Acts 23, verse 11, the Lord tells Paul, you will go to Rome. You will testify in my name. And he held on to that promise. He didn't need a new promise. He needed to remember the old promise. What do we do in a storm? We remember the promises of God. Here's what I did. I got a little list for you here. Look at this list. They're on the screen. And and I want to ask you a question. Which promise, if you're in a storm, which promise do you need to remember? By the way, there are many additional promises that I could have collected for you, but I thought that would be overwhelming. I'd give you five. Here are a few promises. You know, I think that it's interesting to think about discipline and to know that God loves us and his discipline, even born of our sin, that that's good for us. To remember that he's always at work. To remember that he will complete the work that he's begun in you. All of this. Maybe you write one of these down. Maybe you write a couple of these down. Because we've got to hang on to the promises when we're in a storm. Wait on God. Wait on him. Don't abandon him. Don't freak out. Don't panic. You can trust God. Which promise do you need to remember? I'll go back to this movie I mentioned to you, The Martian. This is no spoiler, by the way, if you haven't seen the movie. No spoiler alert at all. Matt Damon is, of course, rescued. That's how the movie ends. Of course he does, right? I knew knew that the day I walked into the theater. I knew that Matt Damon was not going to die in this movie. I knew the hero was going to live. That's the way Hollywood does this. And here was the question. The question wasn't, would he live? The question was, how would he live? How would he live? And this is the, the question we ask in the storm isn't why. The question is more this. When you have a promise in view, the question is how. How will God be proved faithful in this storm? One way or another, whether in this life or next, I'll be delivered. How will will God be proven to be faithful in this storm? Don't ask why, ask how. Here's, Here's what I encourage you to do as we consider the promises of God. When we want to panic, listen, be courageous. Be courageous. 
Trust that God is a promise keeper. That's how you withstand the storm. You trust in him, not in you, not in anything else. Let's keep going. Okay, so let's look at jumping ship here. We've, we've talked about defying wisdom, panicking, freaking out, and now jumping ship. Let's look at verse 27 through 32. On the 14th night, we were still being driven across the Adriatic Sea when about midnight, the sailors sensed they were approaching land. Paul's given them the promise, right? They took soundings and found that the water was 120 feet deep. A short time later, they took soundings again and they found that the water was 90 feet deep. Fearing that we would be dashed against the rocks, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight. In an attempt to escape from the ship, the sailors let the lifeboat down into the sea pretending that they were going to lower some anchors from the bow. And then Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, he caught them and he said, listen, unless these men stay with the ship, you cannot be saved. And so the soldiers cut the ropes that held the lifeboat and let it drift away. Now this is really interesting, okay? So here we go. We're talking about jumping ship and and you see the scene here. You know, Paul's vision, the promise he speaks of, did not come immediately to fruition. In fact, the scripture tells us that still, after Paul gives them the pep talk, 14 days, they're fighting the waves, they're fighting the winds, they're searching for land, nothing's being seen. And of course, they became discouraged. It's interesting, the sailors did something here that was surprising. You know what they did? It says that they prayed for daylight. Paul was evangelizing. You know what he was? He was sharing his faith. He was telling about Jesus. He was calling people to, to pray to God. And in the midst of this, these sailors prayed for daylight. We do this, don't we? When we're in a panic, when we're in a storm, people will cry out to God. They'll pray like they've never prayed before. But here's what happens. We get impatient. And we eventually say, uh, maybe God doesn't hear my prayers or or maybe I, maybe I was wrong. Maybe his promises aren't true for me. And so we'll take matters into our own hands. And that's what they did. They tiptoed in the night. They got the, the little dinghy ready. And they were going to escape. And Paul comes out and Paul says, no, 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 not so fast, my friends. You're not going anywhere. And he calls those sailors to not jump ship. He tells them, don't go anywhere. And amazingly, they stopped. You know what they did? Did you catch it? They cut the ropes. They cut the ropes. In other words, they didn't just back off of the idea. They set their escape pod free. They said, we're not going to use it. It's no longer an option for us. Let me tell you a little story about Christ Church at Grove Farm. About 12 years ago, Our church went through a very difficult season. We had a crisis in senior leadership. And it it appeared, as I'm told, that that the church would be shipwrecked. That in the midst, and if some of you were here, you know this story. That in the midst of this story, and the crisis in senior leadership, this is after John Guest had gone to serve in Florida, and there was a transition in leadership, The question is, what's going to happen? Where are we going to go? Will we survive this? And as I'm told, there were some people in our church, some leaders, who said, not so fast. There's no escape. It would be really tempting to take the escape pod, to take the lifeboat and paddle away from this community. But but many people said, no, let's cut the ropes. There's no escaping. We're going we're gonna to stay here. We're not leaving. I love that story about our church. I believe that informs who we are today. The people who trust in the promise of God, even amid storms. And, and I want to put this in front of you. As you consider storms and you think about the promises of God, hey, maybe you need to cut the ropes and take some options off the table. If it's your marriage, why don't you say this? 
divorce is not an option. It's off the table. We're, we're going to trust that God can heal and that he can mend and he can restore this relationship against all odds. That might be your call. It, it could be that you need to say, you know what? Escaping through alcohol is no longer an, an option for me. I'm cutting the ropes. I'm going to get some help. And I'm no longer going to seek to endure the storm by turning to the bottle. No more. Not an option. Cutting the ropes. It could be that there's a person that you are really tempted to walk away from because, because they hurt you. They let you down. And it would be really easy to walk away and say, I'm done with them. But, but you take that option off the table. You cut the ropes and say, no, I'm here. I'm staying with. I'm going to be a part. I'm going to work this out. Cut the ropes. I love that these men took that step and cut the ropes. What option do you need to take off the table? Cut the ropes. Listen, there is no self-salvation. There's only God's salvation. Wait for him. Okay, so I'm going to summarize the end. I'm not going to actually read it. There's, there's several verses here. I encourage you to read it for yourself. And here's, here's the summary of the ending. They do run aground eventually. As predicted by Paul, the ship is destroyed. And when the ship is destroyed and they run aground, the soldiers decide that they should kill the prisoners so that none of them escape. Well, Paul's one of those, those prisoners. But again, miraculously, the centurion, the Roman centurion, stands up and intervenes on Paul's behalf, and he's spared, along with all the others. In fact, the Bible tells us that everyone, all 260 or so of them, arrived sh safely ashore. Isn't that amazing? And you know, it's, it's kind of funny. It's, it's like the Martian. You knew this was how the story was going to end, right? You knew that Paul was going to live. I didn't have to tell you that when you came in here. Just like I knew that Matt Damon was going to survive. The question is this, how? How will God do it? How will he save Paul? How will he, he see them through the storm? I have tied this, this message, this passage to the story of Jonah. I've mentioned Jonah a couple times. And, and it's interesting because Jesus ties his life to the person of Jonah. In fact, if you read, I think it's Matthew 12. In Matthew 12, you'll see there that, that Jesus says, hey, I'm the greater Jonah. He calls on a familiar story. He says, I'm the greater Jonah. Well, let's think about the story of Jonah for a moment. I told you that he disobeyed God. He ran away from God. God told him to go somewhere. He didn't go. He gets on this vessel. There's a great storm that emerges. Everyone's freaking out. The people don't know what to do, but here's what Jonah knew. Jonah knew that the storm of wrath that was happening was something that was happening because of him. He knew it. And he knew that he deserved the wrath that was coming on him because he had ran away from God. He had disobeyed God. And now it was affecting the other people. And so what does Jonah tell them? He tells them this. He says, hey, hey, throw me in the water. Throw me in the water and you'll be saved. He says, I'll be consumed, but you will live. Now, why does Jesus attach himself to the ministry of Jonah? He was obedient even unto death. Why does Jesus say, I'm the greater Jonah? Well, I think it's because of this. Because we think about storms, there's this idea that, that, hey, in life, there is a storm of God's wrath. And here's the truth of it. Every one of us deserves it. Yeah, it hurts to hear that our storms are caused because of our own disobedience. But every one of us, we've all fallen short. Everyone has sinned. And there is a storm of God's wrath. It's a storm that we deserve. But here's the great news. Jesus says, I'm the greater Jonah. If you believe in Jesus, then you understand this, that he took on the storm for you. He was plunged into the waters of death. 
on your behalf. He, he weathered the storm for you. How does Paul emerge from this? It's all a part of the big narrative that Jesus Christ is the one who took on the storm of, of, of hell for you and for me. He was consumed so that you could be saved. And, and here's the beautiful reality of all this. Jesus, of course, emerged from that storm. And now, when you are in the storm, when you are withstanding the brokenness of this world and it's raging against you, you can know that Jesus Christ is with you in the storm. He's with you in the storm. Only Christianity says that God is with you in your storms, that you're not forsaken, that you're not abandoned, that through pain, through poverty, through betrayal, through grief, you name it, you name the storm, that Christ is really with us. He's with us in the storm. Mm, it's good news, isn't it? So listen, those of you who are weathering a storm or are flying into a storm, listen, you can be brought safely ashore through the confidence of the promises of God which are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Stand with him. Here's how I want to close. I was thinking this morning, I thought the way I want to close is praying for those who are in a storm. If you are in a storm, I want to pray for you. And I pray that you will turn to Jesus as you face your storm. As you prepare to face a storm. If it's coming this week and you don't even know it. That you will, with peace, trust in the promises of God. Trust that Christ is with you in the storm. He took on the storm for you. And that through the grace of God, one way or another, you will be brought safely ashore. Let's pray. I want to pray for you. Oh, Lord, we weather many storms in this life. Forgive us, Lord. These storms are so often our own doing. Forgive, Lord, those around us. They're, they're the doing of people around us, Lord, these storms we face. And they seem to be nonstop. Help us, Lord, to remember your promises whenever the storms of life rage. Help us, Lord, to, to cut the ropes that would, would cause us to be tempted to turn to anything or anyone but you. I pray, Lord, that we would hold on to your promises and that we would remember that Christ is in the storm with us. I pray, Lord, for that grace for everyone in this room, that they have a real sense that Jesus is with them, and I pray, God, that if they haven't grasped this, that if anyone hasn't understood that Jesus took on the storm for them, he endured. Like Jonah, he was plunged into the water, so to speak, but came out victorious. I pray, Lord, they would know that, that the wrath of the storm has been endured on their behalf by Christ. Tell him right now that you love him. Tell him you need him. Tell him that you need him in the storm. Tell Jesus, I'm, I'm, I need you, Father. I need you, Lord. I need you, Christ. Cry out to him. Lord, thank you that you're with us in the storms. We love you. We praise you. We do all this in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit.